Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Isabella Vermesi. I am a PhD student at Imperial College London. Yes. Um, I work with Dr. Guillermo Rain. Um, and this work that I'm going to present today is part of my PhD thesis. And um, this part has been done in collaboration with Gaurav Agarwal from uh, FM Global. He's worked on the experimental part. And Marcos Chaos, also former of FM Global, who now works at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to go a bit uh, more back to the fundamentals. So I'm talking about pyrolysis under transient irradiation today. So not really case study worthy. So first off, I'm going to start by defining uh, pyrolysis. I'm going to define transient irradiation as well and why it is interesting to, to work with. Um, then I'm going to show the basis of our work. So we started off using polymers, uh, PMMA to be more precise. And then after being happy with, with what we got over there, we moved on to another material, to MDF, which is, let's say, more relevant. It's actually more used in, in the built environment compared to PMMA. Um, then we did uh, some experiments with MDF and I'm going to describe them. And then I'm going to describe the model that we used to model those experiments. And I'm going to show you what results we got in constant scenarios and in transient scenarios. Um, and finally, I'm going to conclude with a short parametric study in which I'm going to, it's a very short parametric study, I'm just going to uh, look at two different um, things. So let's go. Um, Pyrolysis, first of all, pyrolysis uh, is the, the thermal and chemical decomposition of a solid into gaseous fuel. So you have, you have the solid, uh, you apply heat to it, and what happens is that it starts, uh, it starts to pyrolyze, and these uh, decomposition gases are going to uh, be emanated from the solid. And when, when these gases form a volatile mixture, then ignition is going to occur like in the third uh, picture. So pyrolysis is important because it is the basis of everything that we do. So it, uh, from pyrolysis, you get ignition after you get the volatile mixture, and the continuous production of these volatile gases is what uh, influences flame spread very much. So what, we, what we've seen today, what we're gonna see further on in this conference, um, are mostly fire safety strategies that are based on ignition. We want to know when material will ignite, so we want to be able to design uh, th these fire safety strategies with passive and, and active measures according to how our uh, buildings are going to behave. And these buildings have different materials, so we all have these uh, informations that finally are based on pyrolysis. So mostly pyrolysis, uh, pyrolysis has been studied widely in, in literature. Um, however, because fire is such a complex phenomenon, if we actually calculated every single part of every single aspect of fire, we'd never do anything because there's simply just so much complexity. So we always make some assumptions. We make some simplifications that we consider more or less important. And um, this one simplification that has been done in, let's say, more than 90% of literature, um, experimental literature, has been to use a constant heat source. So when you do the experiment in the cone calorimeter, you put your sample in, you apply a heat flux that you always know it's, let's say, 50 kilowatts per square meter, and then you get your results, you get what you need from your results, and yeah, you keep, you keep uh, analyzing. However, there has been very, very little investigation of this, this assumption. So all these ignition criteria that we have, all these empirical correlations that we obtained have been from constant sources. So we want to see what happens if we change, uh, change this heat source to transient? It might not make any difference, but it might. So it's very important to actually see what happens. So this, this constant irradiation scenario has been used in most experimental literature, and because it's been in most experimental, it goes on to modeling as well, because modeling is, uh, has to be validated through experiments. Um, the second most used, which is not very used, uh, is the linear heat flux. So there have been a couple of uh, experiments in the literature that use a linear heat flux. And the one that we used is this parabolic curve. And we decided, we decided on it because it captures both the growth of the fire and the decay of the fire. There's obviously a lot more uh, possibilities to um, try these transient scenarios, but this is what we chose and this is what we went for for the purpose of my work. So as I told you in literature, um, there's not a lot done with transient irradiation. This is 
all that I managed to find. So the linear ramps that I, I told you before were used in a couple of experimental works on wood, also on MDF, our co-authors from FM Global, and on polymers at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, there have been a couple of T-squared fires as well, uh, mostly on, on wood. And the parabolic pulses that we have used were initially used for forest fuels at the University of Exeter, and then uh, our PMMA and MDF work at Imperial College. If any of you knows any other works that have used transient irradiation, please feel free to come talk to me in one of the breaks. I would be very happy to know, especially experimental works. So first off, um, I started off my thesis by um, looking at PMMA. So PMMA is one of the most widely investigated materials in literature. It was chosen initially because people thought that it was actually very easy to, to model, that it's not, not a very complex material, it's got quite a simple chemistry, and so there was a lot of work done in it. Actually, after doing a lot of work in it, we came to the conclusion that it's not a very simple material at all, and that it's quite complex. However, because there is so much material on it, uh, we use it very frequently as a base case. So we do stuff on PMMA, then if we're happy with it, we validate it, and we move on to more interesting materials that have not been so studied. So it's, it's very hard to just start off with MDF. Nobody's going to believe your work. So we started um, with uh, one curve. So this red curve over here is the first curve that we applied to the PMMA sample. It has a peak heat flux of 30 kilowatts per square meter and a time to peak of 320 seconds. The reason why we chose these particular values, because if you see, they're quite low. So it's nothing like what would happen in a real fire of, uh, after flashover so, or anything like that. So we just, we wanted this value because it's not high enough that it will ignite everything and um, the parameters that we use are not going to be influential. So if you have, if you apply very high heat flux, then the parameters that you use in a simulation, the thermal properties, are not very relevant anymore because it's just going to be the flame heat flux overwhelming everything. On the other hand, it's not low enough that it's not going to ignite. So then, our, our base case is not very interesting. So this one was a, a safe case. And then we continued by increasing and decreasing the heat flux to uh, 45 or lowering it to um, 25 kilowatts um, or I increasing or decreasing the time to peak. So the curves were either narrower or wider. And uh, we obtained ignition for some of the values. Um, for, some, for other values, we didn't. Um, we proceeded then to model these experiments. So we did a one-dimensional model in GPyro, which is an academic open source code written by Chris Lautenberger. And uh, so we, de we defined the PMMA domain. It's a one-dimensional uh, model. Uh, we gave the thickness that was in the sample. We applied uh, the boundary conditions at the bottom, we consider it adiabatic, and the top, we applied the thermal radiation and considered also the convection heat losses and the re-radiation. Uh, oh yeah, and this, this uh, G-Pyro model is based on uh, chemical kinetics and uh, heat transfer. So it's not just heat transfer or just chemical kinetics. And what we obtained in this plot, you see different um, temperatures at different depths. So at uh, 2 millimeters, 5 millimeters, 8 millimeters, and 10 millimeters. And uh, the solid lines are our predictions, and the dashed lines are the experiments. So there is, the model does uh, underpredict the, the experiments slightly. However, we did not optimize the model at all. We just used uh, thermal properties for values from literature. So we were happy with this approach, and we were happy with the results. So we went on to work with MDF. So MDF is, uh, so if PMMA is just more of a theoretical material, uh, MDF is, is a material that is actually widely used in the built environment. So um, it's an engineered wood product that has been obtained by wood fib fibers that were glued together. And then um, after you applied pressure and heat, you get this um, panel. And um, it's used for furniture. You can use build cabinets out of it. And you can also use it for separating walls. Sorry. Uh, so what we did was um, MDF experiments. They were the same as the PMMA experiments in the fact that they were done in the fire propagation apparatus. So in the fire propagation apparatus, you are able to control 
um, and to program the heat flux uh, the way you want it. So we put um, an MDF sample of 30 millimeters thickness. Um, we put it in the FPA. We isolated it with uh, a few layers of insulation. We measured the surface temperatures with an infrared pyrometer, so we didn't have any interference from the thermocouple uh, that was drilled inside the sample. And the mass loss was recorded using a load cell. However, um, mass loss was a bit tricky to measure because um, it wasn't just measured, measuring the sample weight, so it was measuring the whole thing, and there was a lot of uncertainty going on over there. So we applied seven transient scenarios and one constant scenario. We also wanted to apply a constant irradiation just so if we are happy with what we modeled there, we could go on to the transient. Um, in this plot, I didn't put the constant because it's just a straight line. So they are also around max so maximum 40 kilowatts per square meter. The first one was, again, 30, so they are quite low values. Um, and different... Um, time scales, so going from a time to peak of 160 seconds to um, 480 in this case. We did the MDF model just like we did the PMMA one on the same principles, so we used the one-dimensional model uh, in GPyro. Again, we applied an adiabatic boundary condition on the bottom of the sample, and on the top of the sample we applied the heat flux. Uh, we used an Arrhenius equation for the pyrolysis rate, and um, yeah, it's, it's like it's shown here. Um, and um, now I'll give more details about the MDF model, uh, about the kinetics that we used. So first off, uh, we start with a drying step. So this MDF um, that we had, had a uh, content of moisture of 7%. So we wanted first off to uh, consider the drying. And then afterwards, the four components of MDF, which are hemicellulose, cellulose, lignin, and resin, are transformed into char plus pyrolysis. For simplicity's sake, we consider that these chars to be the same for all of the components. And um, as I said, the kinetic constants, um, the pre-activation, uh, pre-exponential factor, activation energy, and heat of pyrolysis, we considered them from literature. So we did not optimize anything. We just took literature values, and these literature values were mostly from experimental work, so they, they were measured. And the temperature-dependent properties, the same. We've been using them from, from literature, apart from density, which we were able to measure for our sample. So we use the density, the actual density of the sample. And what we got, so first off, for the constant irradiation scenario, uh, oops, this is the surface temperature that I'm showing here. Uh, the red line is the model prediction, and the triangles are the measurements. So uh, it was uh, very well predicted, and we were very happy with it. So for the mass loss rate, again, the mass loss rate is underpredicted, especially in the beginning. There is this peak uh, in the experiments that has not been captured in the model. But again, not that I want to blame all, only the experimentalists for this, um, it's extremely hard to, to measure the mass loss rate in this situation because you actually measure the mass loss and every single um, noisy measurement gets amplified in the, in the mass loss rate curve. So it's an added layer of uncertainty. But we were happy with this, so we went on to the transient case, where again, the model slightly overpredicts. In this case, it overpredicts the, um, the measurement right before ignition. So um, again, I repeat, we didn't look in the behavior after ignition occurred, so we didn't look at all at burning. We just looked at pyrolysis uh, uh, prior to ignition. And for mass loss rate, again, mass loss rate is quite underpredicted uh, for the transient case. Um, and now, I think, yeah, now I will go and talk about the parametric study. So we looked into two things. First off, we wanted to evaluate the influence of drying, because uh, as I said, this, these MDF samples had a moisture content in them, so we wanted to see if the, adding the kinetic, uh, the, the, step, the drying step in the kinetic scheme has a huge influence over the final results or not. And then, again, we used um, temperature-dependent properties. So if you have your sample, you apply heat to it, and you consider that its uh, thermal properties will just stay the same as they were in the beginning, then you use constant properties. But if you have a correlation between um, the temperature and the value of the property, then you use temperature-dependent properties. And uh, this is the first one that I'm going to talk about. 
So for the surface temperature, the red line is the model that I've shown you before with temperature-dependent properties that have been taken from literature. These correlations were taken from literature. And the um, blue dot dashed line is the model with constant temperatures. Um, for the mass loss rate, this is almost, there's no improvement, there's a very tiny change, but it's negligible. So if you're looking into um, modeling something, but you do not really have the correlations for temperature-dependent properties, that is not such a big deal to not use temperature-dependent properties. So they do improve the model, but they're not groundbreaking. However, drying, as you can see, is very important. Uh, in the case of the surface temperature, the model without drying is this one with the um, blue dashed line, and it's severely overpredicting um, the temperatures. And that is because um, there is, so if you have drying, the initial uh, wave of temperature is being used to dry up all the, the water from the sample. Instead, if you don't use drying, it just, it's considered to go inside the sample already. So that's why the temperatures are higher in this case. And for mass loss rate, again, the difference is major. So even the shape of the curve is completely different uh, in the case of um, no drying versus the case with drying. Yeah, so now on to my conclusions. So what we did was subject uh, MDF samples to transient irradiation to see whether or not um, we can obtain some, some good results. And we used a 1D model and the surface temperatures were, were, were well predicted in, in both cases. The mass loss rate is also uh, well predicted, but there's a bit of an uh, under prediction. And the drying step is essential for modeling MDF. Uh, when possible, it's good to use temperature dependent properties, but when not, it's, it's not a, a big problem. We are going to look next into the burning of, of MDF because we want to see whether the behavior is different than when applying constant irradiation, so we can make better comparisons. Yeah, thank you. If you've got any questions. Questions? Yeah, I'm trying. Um, my question relates to the, excuse me, the density of the material. Um, I can't speak to your MDF because it depends on the process and everything, but in New Zealand we see as much as a factor of two between what we get in the center versus at the edge. Have you looked at that and tried to incorporate that? Because we've seen it to be quite a significant factor, and especially in the detail you're looking for with the time dependence just makes it more difficult. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of, of the density change between the center and the, the um, edges of the sample. However, uh, I've not incorporated that in the model because we looked at um, to go from simple to more complex. So we wanted to, to try it simple with regular density, with uh, homogeneous density everywhere. And uh, we want to look in the future, especially for burning, we want to look into uh, keeping the density profiles um, different. So yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding pyrolysis and engineering studies. Um, how do you feel this is mature to include it in, in engineering studies? Because I've been uh, obliged myself to use it uh, because of the terms of the contract. And what I really made at the end was to choose the, the variables in order to get a reasonable heat release rate because it was very difficult. To, to model precisely what the, the client wanted to do. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't catch the, the you, beginning uh, part. Did you feel that the, the technology, the modeling technology is mature enough or is it going to be mature enough to use it in, in real engineering analysis, not in research and development? Mm. Do you pyro mean? Um, I don't think it's usable uh, for, like, for client work. I think it's mostly academic. I think it's, well, it was actually built by just one person during their PhD, and I think that's amazing. I, I couldn't have never done that during my PhD. Um, it definitely needs, needs more work. Um, I think as an academic code, it's very good, but you need to know its shortcomings. For client work, I wouldn't recommend it with, like, wholeheartedly. So, yeah. I have a question just for myself. Um, why G pyro over the FDS solid phase solver? Um, I 
think we just wanted, uh, well, because we wanted to use Gpyro. Um, <laughs> I guess one, one question would be, is there a plan maybe to also look at the difference between the solution from GPyro and the solution of the FDS solid phase solver? Um, yes, I think so, but I'm not sure I will be able to do it during my PhD. There was in the plan, so in my okay. initial plan of the work, it was to look at, at FDS as well and see how it compares to GPyro or the other way around. Um, if I have time, then if I have time left in my PhD, then definitely I will look at it because it's something interesting. Okay. Anyone else question? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.